Good morning, YouTubers. You have reached the Brian Sledge channel. Please like, subscribe, and hit the bell for notifications. Uh, thank you very much, and have a great day. Bye. Good evening all, and welcome. Before the video begins, I have a really quick request. I have a friend in real life, and she started a YouTube channel about two years ago. She stopped because of work, as most people tend to do, but is finally in a situation where she can really give it her all. She's currently lurking at around 500 subs, I think? Maybe a bit more? And I think it'd be a really nice surprise if tomorrow morning she wakes up and sees a thousand subs or, you know, just, just a bigger number, really. I just think it'd be a really nice thing to do. Bear in mind that she specializes in cooking, vlogging, and veganism. So if you like any one of those three things, feel free to check her out. Or even if you don't, check her out anyway. She's a really fun and engaging person, and it would mean a lot to me. I've left a link in the description, and I'm going to put a link at the end of the video. Again, it would mean a lot to me. So thanks, guys. But without further ado, it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. No wood may I... No wood may I was about seven years old. My family had just moved into a new house a few months previously. So we were in the process of adjusting to it. One night, I was feeling sick. And when I feel sick, I prefer to sleep on the couch in our living room. I had fallen asleep at around 10 p.m. or so and slept for a few hours. I remember vividly the dream that I had that night. To summarize, I was swinging on a rope off a dock and into some deep water. For some reason, when I fell in, I couldn't swim. I remember the feeling of drowning before I snapped awake. As soon as I woke, I noticed that a small rocking chair that we usually keep near our front door was now located in the middle of the room facing me. I closed and rubbed my eyes for a second, and when I opened them, the chair was right in front of my face next to the couch. My heart skipped a beat as the chair came into clearer focus. I realised it wasn't a chair, but a small, half-translucent man. I could see his form, but I could also see right through him. The best way that I can describe this man is that he looked extremely similar to Gimli from Lord of the Rings. To be clear, I hadn't seen any Lord of the Rings movies at this point, and wouldn't for another few years. I never felt like this was a sinister presence, because he was smiling at me. He had a small pack on his back, and tattered clothes that suggested he was a traveller. I know for a fact that I was awake, because I remember his sudden appearance scaring the living crap out of me. I covered my head with the blanket, and shivered out of fright for three hours until my dad came downstairs from his bedroom, ready to get to work. My second experience was when I was around 12 years old. I remember being extremely excited to spend the night at a close friend's house. His family had a lot of land, so we usually rode go-karts and explored their woods. This night, however, was going to be even better. Instead of sleeping in their main house with the parents, we were going to sleep in the original house on the property. For a little background on this house, it was built in the 1800s. It was intended to be a place for loggers to have a place to stay while working in the area. There were four of us sleeping in the house that night. My friend Brandon, his two younger brothers and myself. Anyway, we had our sleeping bags set up in a row in the living room. We played some games and had finally settled down into our bags for the night. The fire was low and we were all getting tired. 
A little while after we shut off the lights, we were talking quietly and laughing. The only light in the room was from the soft glow of the dying embers in the fireplace. The room fell silent for a moment, from a brief pause in conversation, and I heard clearly footsteps walking up the old stairs right in front of us. Now there was no wall covering these steps, so they were visible from our spot. My first thought was that someone had woken up and was planning to mess with the rest of us. However, I looked over. All three sleeping bags were full. We looked at each other wide-eyed, and then back to the stairs. No one was there. Whatever was walking up them made it to the second floor, and walked into one of the bedrooms. The door to the bedroom slammed shut, and that was the last we heard from it. I asked Brandon if it could be his dad sneaking in to mess with us, but... There was absolutely no way it could have been him. The only way to those stairs is to walk through the living room over the top of us, and nobody had come through. Later that night, after we had finally fallen asleep, Brandon woke up to see a small glowing orb that floated from the basement stairs over through the dining room and out through the wall into a back storage room. The following morning, Brandon asked his parents if there was anything that had been taken in that room over the years, and his mum told us that the front door of the house used to be there, but it had been relocated to its current spot when the house was renovated in the mid-1900s. It has been 13 years since that experience. Brandon's younger brother lives in that house now, and every time I visit, I get a weird feeling that there's something in there, watching us. This third experience is a little more sinister. It happened about six years ago. I have no idea what was following me around, but it was a very dark feeling presence. It all started at work. I was on the graveyard shift for the first time. I had been trained on a new job, and this was the first time I would be operating the batching plant alone. Of course. I got lucky and had to work alone at night. The first couple of days went about as smooth as they could have. Nothing much happened, and I developed a good rhythm for getting things done. One night, I started to have a very weird feeling that I was being watched. I'm sure a lot of people can relate to that feeling. I looked around the area and came up empty on my search. No one was there. So I went about my business and made it through the night. The next night while out working, I got the same feeling. This went on for a while. Most nights while working out there, I would get that feeling you get, and I couldn't figure out why. A couple of weeks later at about midnight, the feeling returned, this time stronger. Something drew me down to the first floor of the building, and when I got there, I found a strange pair of footprints. They weren't human, though. I've seen many animal prints from our native animals, yet I'd never seen a pair like these. They are about three, maybe four inches long, and similar to a deer's hooves, but shaped slightly wider and bigger than any deer I had seen in the area. They also had a round print right behind the two hooves, like the foot had three points of contact with the ground. The weirdest thing about these prints is that they started in the centre of the room, walked around the conveyor, and towards the main roll-up door. However, they didn't go all the way to the door, but stopped about eight feet away from it. I never found the source of these prints, but I did hear many unnatural sounds in that area throughout the night. After that, nothing really happened for a week or so, until one night while I was home. I'd gone to bed early that night to try and catch up on a little sleep. While I was asleep, I had another extremely vivid dream. In my dream, I was at work in the batch plant. 
my best friend at the time was there with me. It was a rough night, and it seemed like we couldn't catch up or get anything done. I was on the first floor when a couch appeared against one of the walls. I walked over to it and laid down to take a nap. And as soon as I was laying flat on the couch, a dark cloud appeared in the middle of the room. It floated there for a moment before bearing down on me. As soon as it was on top of me, I felt as if there was a massive weight pushing down on my entire body. I snapped awake to my room, almost pitch black, with what looked like dark grey smoke filling the room. That weight from the dream was still pushing on my body. I was able to move, however, which scared me as I realised this was not sleep paralysis. Whatever had tried to smother me in the dream was real. It was in my room with me. I closed my eyes and I started to pray that whatever was there would go away. I opened my eyes again and the smoke was gone. The weight was lifted from my body and I felt free. I couldn't sleep for the rest of the night for obvious reasons, so I watched movies until the sun came up. Over the next few weeks, I felt that feeling of being watched at work, but every time I felt it, I would pray and the feeling left. Life went back to normal soon after. It finally left me alone, whatever it was, and I hope not to come across it again. I've had weird things happen to me my entire life. I haven't in a while, and there will be a long period when nothing happens. And it's weird for me to think back to all those times of paranoia and fear. And I start to get comfortable and think, I don't really believe in that stuff anyway. But eventually, it does catch up to me. As a child, lots of things happened. And it was easy for my parents to say, that it was my imagination, until my friends started experiencing them too, and stopped spending the night. First thing that happened, I must have been about four or five, I saw Grim Reapers walking through my house. I don't know what Grim Reapers were, and I don't know if that's what they were. They were just walking black cloaks with no faces. I was sitting on my mother's lap and started screaming at the top of my lungs, crying and hysterical. I still remember it. There must have been at least ten of them, and they walked down the hallway facing our living room, going into each of our bedrooms and never coming out. I was afraid to sleep alone after that, and to be honest, I had my mum sleep with me until I was probably about thirteen. I slept with all the lights on until I was 10, and I still have a phobia about open doors. Lots of weird things happened with me and my friends too, too many to count. But among them were the music box noises playing from the walls, scratches from my cabinets, which I checked over and over again, and there weren't any rats or geckos like my parents told me. But one of the scariest was this noise. I can't explain it. Almost beautiful, but like a woman wailing and singing at the same time. My friend and I both heard it. I ignored it, thinking it was the TV. She asked, Do you hear that? And we both stared wide-eyed, turning the TV on and off, and hearing it even louder. We ran outside, and didn't come back, until my parents returned. Our maid, who was stereotypically superstitious, said she saw angels in the house, and our neighbours supposedly said the house was haunted when we were moving in. I don't remember that, as it was before I was born. Well, I'm off to a new house. Nothing really scary happens here for a long time. The only weird thing was as a preteen I recorded myself singing, and when I listened back, there was a male's voice saying hello in the background. But all of a sudden in my late teens, I began to develop sleep paralysis. 
and I get this overwhelming feeling that those hooded things are back. I can't explain it, and I legitimately thought I was going crazy, because I would be afraid to leave my bathroom, thinking that they were there. Sleep paralysis got increasingly worse. Almost every night I would wake up to hear a demonic scream in my ear, and I wouldn't be able to move. Sometimes I'd wake up as I was hitting my head against the wall. My parents began to get concerned. Then one day, I get a call from my mum's friend. She's at our house. My mum is acting strange. Turns out, my mum suffers from schizophrenia slash bipolar disorder, and she was going through mania. She was convinced in her paranoia that demons were in our house. She told me that they were coming to get me, and she did really strange things, like I would come home and all of the lights would be on, all of the faucets, and every single drawer and cabinet would be opened. I always thought it was weird, because I felt like I had a premonition. But really, I suppose, it could be that I subconsciously knew something was up. And maybe, that just fed into her later mania and paranoia about demons. Since then, it hasn't been a whole lot. There was a brief period of a couple of incidences. An old music box I had started playing at three in the morning. A shell chandelier had slipped itself horizontally against a wall. That was probably three years ago, and nothing since then. Honestly, when things start to happen, I become so frustrated. I know I'm not in danger, but I feel like things are messing with me, and I hate it. To be honest, it's been so long that I don't think about it, and if people ask me if I believe in the paranormal, I'd honestly say I wouldn't know. When I'm in the midst of it all, I definitely believe. I feel like things are messing with me, and everyone around me probably thinks I'm crazy. But in the off periods, it's easy for me to just forget and blow it off. I'm a 35 year old man from England. This story took place nearly 25 years ago, when I was 11 years old. I was in a prominent boarding school in the southwest of England. At that age, I just started to get interested in the idea of the paranormal, and was sure my school was haunted. But until then, I'd had no experiences. It happened one night during the summer term. I got up to go to the bathroom. It was around 2am. It was a very clear night, and the moon was bright. So it was easy to find my way through the long corridors to the toilet without a torch. On the way back to my dormitory, I noticed how cold it was, but didn't want to run through fear of waking anyone up and being busted for being out of bed in the middle of the night. My dormitory was halfway down a corridor, with a matron's flat next door and another larger dormitory at the far end. There was a bookcase next to the door to that dormitory, and a couple of windows along the wall of the corridor, letting in the bright moonlight. I came round the corner atop the corridor. I paused at the top of the steps leading down towards my dorm, and I could clearly see in the moonlight a boy standing next to the bookcase. He was wearing pyjamas, slippers, and a dressing gown. And even though he was clearly looking back at me, I couldn't see his face. A bolt of fear shot down my spine, and my face went cold. Who's that? I stammered. Even though I couldn't see his face, I knew he was looking right at me. But without a single word, he vanished into thin air. He didn't walk away, he just disappeared. I was rooted to the spot for a moment, as I tried to process what I had just witnessed. I broke myself from my thoughts and scurried back to bed, but didn't sleep for the rest of the night. A couple of years later, having not thought about it for some time, it was brought back to me when I heard that just after the Second World War, 
a boy had been taken to the hospital with pneumonia. He died there a few days later. Was it him I saw that night? Maybe, but I'll never know. I've been looking for evidence of the paranormal ever since. This experience takes place several years ago, when I was 13. I was a lonely child and had no friends to speak of. So I joined the football team as a way of improving my non-existent social life. I was good at it, especially for someone with no experience. But I was still a bit of an ill fit. Around the same time, another kid named Bruce moved into the area. Bruce was a different guy, quiet but mischievous, and he also joined the football team. Bruce was the only person I have ever met who enjoyed football practice. He was a bit different. He'd randomly show up at my house one Saturday morning and said that he found out I lived nearby and decided to come over and see if I wanted to ride bikes with him. I didn't own a bike then and still don't now. I don't have a balance for the bloody thing, but I told him that I would go with him on foot and he promised not to ride too fast. I got it. Bruce was lonely and bored just like me and was looking for something to do. Down the road from my house at the time, there were a set of trailers that were owned by the local cantacarous old man. Four old trailers on land he owned and he used them to store his junk in. They were decrepit, rusted and uninviting and immediately became an object of fascination to Bruce. So before I knew it, we were poking around the old man's property. Fortunately, he was never there and never sent anyone to check on his property either. Bruce started messing with the doors of one of the trailers, which was nailed shut with an old rusty nail. Now I'm the kind of person who feels guilty for speeding. I'm not the type to be dangerous and go looking for trouble. I hesitated, but didn't want to seem uncool. I was 13 after all, and reluctantly followed Bruce's lead. He pried off the nail and opened the door and said, want to check it out? I followed him in. For the record, this was my only brush with criminality, and I still feel weird about it. Bruce and I found the trailer to be pretty much exactly what you would expect. Rooms filled with old furniture, clothes, toys, and other assorted crap. Bruce said, you have to check this area out and I'll go this way, and disappeared into one of the bedrooms. I had no idea what we were checking out the area for. And once Bruce left the area, a strange, isolated, and in danger feeling swept over me. This next part I remember vividly and can only describe. It's something I have never felt before and hope I never feel again. I felt a wave of energy pass up through the floor and wiggle its way up my legs and through my body and then out the top of my head. It felt like an electric shock, but moving in a wave. It was so intense it nearly knocked me down. Bruce, I shouted. He came running back around the corner and said, what's wrong? I shook my head and said, nothing. I just felt something. He nodded and said, let's get out of here. I still don't know if he was creeped out as well or if he had lost interest. Bruce and I left the trailer and traveled for a little while longer. As the sun set, he told me he had to head back home and asked if I could make it back home on my own. I cannot tell you the feeling of dread and just being in danger that I felt as I passed the old man's trailer again. It was unlike anything I have ever felt since. Bruce never came over again and moved away about a year later. To put a dark exclamation point on the experience, it was only a few months later 
that I sank into a deep and suicidal depression. This would begin an extremely difficult period of my life that would last several years and included depression, poor health, anxiety, medication and hospitalization and still affects me to this day. It was only later on that I discovered that the man who originally owned the land before the old man had killed himself with one of the trailers after his wife left him. I think about that a lot and wonder what I experienced and if the man's spirit was angry at me and let me experience some of his anguish. I don't know honestly, but I know that the old man passed away later and the city government seized his property and demolished the trailers. Four houses were built on the land, but no one lives there for very long. I've lived in haunted houses all my life. For reference, I'm a 40 year old woman living in the UK. It started as far back as I can remember. A lot of it I had tried to block out, but I just can't escape it. I've been told by a couple of mediums that I am sensitive. I think things just attach themselves to me. This story is not all that awe-inspiring, but true. So one night, I went to bed at around midnight. It's the usual time I crash, and proceeded with my nightly routine of watching Netflix for a few hours no until I fell asleep. No I think I was watching Kath and Kim, or maybe YouTube, definitely nothing creepy, and I began to get to sleep. Then I felt my partner get into bed, which I guess I tried to ignore, so I would fall asleep, except I just couldn't ignore it. I began to feel a kind of dread, and it was a dread that I had never felt before. I remember feeling frozen in bed, not in temperature, in movement. I couldn't move. I knew then that something paranormal was about to happen to us. I've learned to recognize the signs, such as room temperature, gut feelings, and electrical problems. While I was in bed, I could feel that he was literally kicking the bed covers to where my feet were and causing a real fuss. Kind of as though he was having a tantrum kicking his feet around. But surprisingly, his feet never struck mine. Normally I'd turn around to ask what's wrong, except I just couldn't. I was frozen. I've had feelings of dread before, but not like this. It was so bad that I was whimpering and tears were streaming down my face. The worst feeling of dread I've ever known in my life had completely consumed me. What was going on? Why was I feeling this way? I don't know why but I was caught completely off guard. And it was as though something in my head was screaming at me to not turn around, whatever I do. I couldn't have, even if I did want to, because I couldn't move. Literally just a few minutes later, while he was messing around with the quilt, and when I was able to think again and move due to the feeling of dread lifting slightly, I began to feel cross, so I told him off. Bloody hell, Donald. Will you just take the quilt? I'm too hot anyway, and knock it with the kicking off. Even though I was getting really annoyed at him, I still couldn't bring myself to turn around and look. So, then he stopped doing whatever he was doing with his feet as quickly as he started, and suddenly I was fine. The feeling of dread had gone. He had the quilt to himself, and I went to sleep. Next thing I know, I was awoken by him coming into the bedroom at 5am. He was fully clothed, which, in my sleepy state, totally confused me. So I asked him why he was dressed, thinking he might have an early commute. And he then told me that he had fallen asleep on the couch, and was just coming to bed now. What? Please tell me you got into bed earlier and were messing around with the quilt. His reply was, No. My stomach sank. I felt sick. 
I told him what happened, and as always, he brushed it off, as he is in denial about anything paranormal being in this house, even though it was built in 1890 by a prominent family from London as a holiday villa, and we have details of a few deaths occurring here. It's not the first time something has gone into bed with me, but it usually happens when he is working away and I'm alone. The previous times I've had my hair stroked or my back touched gently. I was freaking out when it happened, but nothing in comparison to this. This was next level. I can't help but wonder, if my bed didn't have a footboard, would the quilt have been pulled off from me to the bottom of the bed instead? To me, that seems worse than what I experienced. This happened just a few months ago, and I'm dreading the next time he goes away, or falls asleep on the couch. My grandfather passed away this February. As both my parents are from Pennsylvania, we all plan to spend some time with my grandmother back east. The day before my family and I were due to fly out for his funeral, we received a call from my grandparents' home phone number. When my dad picked up and put the phone on speaker to greet whom we assumed was my grandmother, the line went quiet, save for a subtle white noise that sounded like crickets softly chirping. Despite my father and I saying hello over and over, the noise continued uninterrupted. When my father suggested that perhaps it was my grandma calling on her cell phone, and for some reason it was showing up as their home phone number, I used my cell phone to call my grandmother's mobile number. My father and I glanced at one another as we listened to my phone ring, and then my grandmother picked up. I looked sharply at my father, as he also caught on. Whoever had called him, it wasn't my grandmother. I chatted briefly with my grandmother on my mobile, asking her if she had tried to call on her cell or home phone any time that day. She said that she hadn't. The eerie yet almost soothing sounds continued on and on. Crickets amidst the quiet rush of a gentle wind. Following about 30 minutes of this quiet rushing sound, my father said, Dad, if this is you, we love and miss you, and we want you to know that we arranged you a nice obituary. With that, the line went dead. Nearly a year has passed, and neither my father nor I are quite sure what happened that day. Being a doctor, my father's logical explanation holds that somehow, the phone lines got crossed with another caller, something he admits he's never experienced before. I have quite a pragmatic mind myself. I'd never given much thought to the possibility of the existence after death, but the moment that mystery call came in, I had to wonder. Could it have been my grandfather's presence just before departing this world? Had he simply stuck around to ensure we had written him a nice epithet? He always had enjoyed talking, and he had passed in his sleep. I can't help but think that maybe this was his way of bidding us all farewell. My great-grandmother lived with my family at our old house. We had built an addition onto the house, so that she could have her own kitchen, bathroom and bedroom. After her death, we boxed up her belongings which included her Bible, and various other books and knickknacks. And I ended up moving into that addition, since I was the oldest kid still living at home. About a month or so after she died, I was home alone. I had just gotten home from school and decided to watch television in the family room. I settled down, turned on the TV, and proceeded to chow down on a big bag of chips. An hour or so goes by, and I hear what sounded like a door slamming down at the addition. 
my first instinct was to see if my brother was home without my knowledge, since he had a bad habit of slamming doors. I started down the hall towards his room. I never had a chance to open his door. Further down the hall, in the addition, I saw a person head directly towards my bedroom. It was at this point that I had to fight the incredible urge to soil myself. I knew there was an axe murderer in the house, and that it was going to be up to me to stop them. I entered my brother's room and grabbed the first weapon I could find, a plastic lightsaber. I slowly crept towards the addition. The closer I got, the colder the air around me felt. It was the strangest feeling ever. I slowly entered my room and saw nothing. I had seen enough movies to know that the axe murderer was in one of two places, either under my bed or in my closet. I checked under the bed first. Nothing. I then flung open the closet, fully expecting an axe murderer versus lightsaber battle, but was thankfully disappointed. I began to creep around the addition, looking for signs of a break-in. I found nothing along those lines. But what I did find still creeps the hell out of me to this day. On my great-grandmother's couch, the couch she sat on every day that I can remember, I found her open Bible. The same Bible that had been boxed up a few weeks earlier. When my oldest daughter was just around three years old, she started talking to someone called Alex. We just put it down to the usual imaginary friend sort of stuff and never really thought much about it. Then there were some strange occurrences going on in the house. Her electronic toys would randomly start during the night. She was in a cot bed at the time, so it wasn't possible it was her, unless she jumped to the side of the bed and then climbed back in, which she couldn't do. One of the weirdest ones was when I was getting her ready for a bath. Normal routine was to take her dirty clothes off on the upstairs landing, then throw the dirty clothes over the banister onto the floor at the bottom of the stairs. There was nobody else home except me and her. When I went downstairs after the bath, fully expecting to pick up the clothes at the bottom of the stairs, I found them sitting on the floor in the kitchen, which was a few metres to the left of the stairs. Unless someone picked them up and put them there, or there was a gust of wind through the house, it was physically impossible for the clothes to end up where they did. The icing on the cake was when we happened to mention about the little ones, imaginary friends, to the next door neighbours. They had lived in their house since it was built, the same time ours was built, and when we told them about the friend being called Alex, they informed us that the original owner of the house was called Alex, and he had passed away in the house one night while sitting watching TV. The neighbours could well have been pulling our legs, but they were an elderly couple who were always very sincere. I had no reason to think they were trying to wind us up. In time, she stopped talking about Alex, but seriously creeped us out when we found this out from the neighbours. We never mentioned anything about it to her as she got older, and certainly wouldn't tell her about Alex, having been a deceased owner of the house. There were never any sinister goings on, just little things that seemed to defy logic. I'm neither a skeptic, nor a 100% believer in things like this, but it certainly does make me wonder. So I had a very strange episode when I was much younger. This was not fever induced, but I still can't explain it to this day. My family had two landline phones. The main family phone line and the kids for my brother, sister and myself. An internet dial-up landline too. This was pretty cool, as this meant that we could conference call before Skype or VoIP took off. 
We had a really friendly neighbour that lived next door, who we would often hang out with. I was old enough at this point, being 12, that my parents trusted my friends, and me, to be alone at home. So one weekend evening, I had three other friends over, and we were in my room playing perfect dark. It must have been around 2000 or 2001, and my parents left my friends and I home for a quick little bit, and went over to our neighbour's house. But my brother and sister were out for the evening. Of course, when they left, the entire house was locked. The garage door was up, and if someone wanted to get in, they would have had to break in. Now my room was at one end of the house, but I could of course still hear the family phone, and definitely could hear the voicemail for the phone. And of course, as usual, my parents come back and ask if anyone has called while they were away. I say no one's called, and my parents see they have a new voicemail from within that period of time. Funny, because I never heard the phone. They play the voicemail and it goes something like this. Hi, is James there? No, James is out for the evening. Okay, well tell him I called. Yeah, I will. Now, we sat and listened to the voicemail about three times. You could hear us in the background playing Perfect Dark. We were the only ones there. We still have no idea who that was. I had many friends who were into the devil-worshipping scene. They were goths with black hair, spikes, and ripped black clothing. The whole shebang. There were many times I was invited to their Ouija sessions. Of course, I would decline. I'm a skeptic. But still, I didn't want to risk it if it were real. One of them, a girl called Skye, didn't show up at school anymore after inviting me to a Ouija session. I spoke to people who were there during one of her sessions, and their story was that she asked the spirits to talk to her. After hearing nothing, she would laugh. Her friends laughed with her as a joke, and after a couple of laughs, the friends stopped. But she continued, hard and uncontrollably. When one of her friends grabbed her by the shoulder, she fell down and began to convulse hard while still laughing. They would try to assist her, without results. An ambulance was called, and she was taken to the hospital. A while after that, I went out with her. And there I began talking to her, but something caught her eye. Upon looking in the direction, she would scream out at the top of her lungs, completely horrified, and exited the restaurant quickly. Everyone was looking, and I felt so embarrassed. After that, I never saw her again. The school said it was due to drugs, alcohol abuse, and depression, but I'm not sure. I can't look inside her head. I have a very good friend. We've been friends for years. He is someone who you would call gifted, and had a few encounters with the paranormal in the past. He told me the following story. One time, he was just at home watching a horror movie. He forgot the title, but he thinks it could have been The Ring. He laid on the couch with his cat, and because the house was old, it had a freaky vibe of its own. That, combined with the movie, gave it a double eerie feeling. As he was watching the film, he felt odd and a bit off. The air in the house was cold, and when he breathed, he'd see the air he just exhaled in the air. He shook it off as the furnace was just broken again, but he felt that eerie feeling. He thought about turning off the movie, and he began to become paranoid and uneasy. All of a sudden, the light dimmed to a low pitch light. The air became heavy and cold, and he felt like something was looking at him in the hallway. He looked in there, and what he saw made his blood run cold. A heavy, transparent entity 
walked by with heavy feet. It moved like a giant, one step at a time. After every step, the floor drowned with heavy thumps. The entity stopped, took a good look at him and passed by. But then it returned to look at him again. It was dense, heavy, and it felt evil. His cat completely freaked out against the entity hissing, screaming at it. The entity walked away to the kitchen, and after some pan-making noises, it stopped. The energy in the room was normal again, and the cat calmed down and the lights returned to normal. He needed to process what had just happened and went to his room. Just briefly, I'll explain the room. It was painted black. He was a goth, remember, and that's the way he liked his room. Except for the right wall. He glued many mirror shafts to the wall as decoration, and he had a desk and closet on the left side, and his bed to the other. To empty his mind and forget the incident, he watched Donald Duck cartoons, and just the second he managed to obtain ease, he heard a loud bang. He didn't know where it come from, and after listening, he heard nothing, and he felt safe again. Then all of a sudden, he heard a second bang, and his heavy cabinet was thrown to the corner. It came to a stop with a loud bang, and my friend freaked the hell out, and laid in the fetal position against the mirror wall. Then, another loud bang this time from above him. All the mirror shards started to fall all over him. He was so scared that he passed out, and awoke in an ambulance later. After a couple of days, he was sent back home, and didn't feel like there was an entity there anymore. He didn't want to tell his parents what happened, but he was still curious what the entity was. His father, asked him to clean out his attic, and of course he agreed. They both went upstairs into the dark attic, where there was junk and cotton webs all over the place. The only light came from a small window, and light fell on something reflecting. They took it out the box and looked at it. He felt his stomach turn. It was a picture of an old lady with tight, dead white hair. She looked angry, and he felt the same terror as that day in his room. His father saw it and took the picture from him. He looked at it, and his happy face turned sour. It was his stepmother. She hated children, and he told him she wasn't a nice woman. His mother died at an early age, and was abusive towards his father. He threw the picture away, and was glad to be rid of it. My friend linked this picture with the entity, and after throwing it away, he never saw it again. His second and final encounter that he spoke with me was with his wife. She told him that a shadow figure met her in her dreams. She would then wake up in terror, and the entity would be by her bed. And when she saw him, he attacked her. My friend was very much in love with her, and there was an item of jewellery that she owned, a golden pearl necklace, that had a dark energy linked to it, and he could feel it. He asked her where she got it. Her ex gave it to her after she broke up with him out of Germany on his holiday, and they were good friends still, so she accepted it, and she liked it. After that, she took her necklace and wore it to bed when they were sleeping. To test if he would experience something later that night, he woke up in complete terror, and in the corner, he saw a dark, seven-foot-tall shadow hovering over him. Before he could scream, it grabbed him, and after a fierce struggle, his wife turned on the light, and the entity was gone. After telling her, she decided to put the necklace away in her closet. Later he came home and saw someone sitting in the living room. It was his wife's grandfather. The only thing was, he'd been dead for more than 16 years. 
her grandfather pointed up with his finger towards upstairs and screamed to go get her, that she was in danger. He rushed upstairs and found his wife shaken and panicked crying on the floor. When he touched her, he felt the entity like a heavy cloak in his hands and pulled him away from her. He threw away her necklace outside, through an open window, and the energy in the room returned to normal. Her ex came by at a later date for a visit. After being drunk later that evening, he stated in his own words, You don't even know what I found in Germany and have given to you. That was confirmation for my friend, and he was the one that took the entity to the doorstep. After that, they didn't see him again. I heard that story years later, but I didn't know if it was true. He was a good friend who wouldn't lie to me, so I believe him. After that, he never felt anything again and lived in peace. As for my own story, I never felt or saw anything until that day. Me and my girlfriend live in Holland. We live 20 minutes cycling apart from our homes. On the weekend, I would go to her house, and I would cycle home. It's a long road between our houses, with only street lights and some farmhouses in between. The village is called Lease. It used to be farmland with the odd house here and there, but now it's a bit more modern, with a few warehouse companies in between. Whenever I cycle home, I never have any issues. But this wasn't the case on this night. Be aware, I don't drink or take other stuff, like drugs. I was wide awake and fully conscious at the time. I was cycling home, crossing the lights, and it was a clear night, with the stars and moons showing. I was cycling with my music on, and then something in the distance caught my eye. It looked like a person. It was hunched forwards, and walked with one of those big side-to-side -side steps and looked out in all directions, like it was looking for something. I'm gonna call it an it, because I couldn't make out a gender from that far away. There were many Polish people working there in the flower fields, and they were nice people, and they liked drinking their vodka. So I thought it was a drunk Polish worker, and could just pass. But then I came closer. It was a shadow, a dark shadow. The light on my bike is very bright. It was so bright that if you looked straight at it, you couldn't see anything around you because it was so bright. But my light reflected on it, but still saw no features. It was just a dark black mass, and my light reflected off it. Because of the big side leaps, I couldn't pass it, and exiting the cycle path to drive on the road would be a bad idea. I looked at the shape, and it looked like a woman, an old woman. She wore a long white skirt and a big scarf on her neck, like something you would wear in World War I. She was dark, but I could see some features from her, like a shadow you can see without anyone creating it. Then I was right behind her, my light still reflecting off the entity. I stood still and watched her walk, and look from one direction to another. I rang my bell nervously, and she stopped midway, and turned to look in my direction. I didn't see her face. All that I saw were two bright blue lights where her eyes should have been. She took two steps in my direction, and took a good look at me, and stood there, staring. I was completely paralysed. Her advances continued, and I really became scared. I felt like she was reading my mind. She stepped off the road into the garden next to her, and at that moment, I realised I could pass. And so, I bolted. When I looked back into the garden, though, she was gone. I never saw anything like that again, and I'm glad I didn't. I'm not entirely sure what I saw, but... It just feels so unnatural. Years ago, 
my friend and I left a bar at the last call. We were walking down a convenience store to get sodas and munchies, when we came upon a hysterical lady babbling on in Spanish, with her car stopped in the middle of the road. Neither me or my friend speak a lick of Spanish, so we tried our best to find out what was wrong, with gestures and speaking loudly and slowly in English. The best we could make out was that she left home in a hurry and was afraid to go back. We managed to get her to pull her car over and understood she wanted us to call the police. So there we were waiting for the cops to come, trying to console this stranger over something we had no idea about. Luckily, we were pretty much sober by the time the cops arrived. Unluckily, we had to wait longer for a Spanish-speaking cop to come. Finally, after a good long wait, we got to the root of the thing. Apparently, this lady was convinced that the devil was in her apartment. I'm guessing the cops didn't want to brush it off in case El Diablo was actually an ex-husband or something. This is where it gets interesting for us. The lady said she wanted the police to go with her to check out her house, but she was too scared to drive. So the cops asked us to drive this stranger's car as they followed all three of us to her apartment. Of all the encounters I've had with police after leaving a bar, this was the first time one had told me to get behind a wheel, and it wasn't even my wheel. So we complied. We drove the lady to her home, and the cops went in to check everything out. This is where it gets kind of funny. Apparently, the whole story was that the lady had got baked and passed out on top of the remote for her TV. Eventually, she rolled over and the TV turned on. When she woke up startled, she assumed the devil was in her house and had turned on the TV. The sad part was even after figuring all of this out, she was still convinced that the devil was in her house. The cops had fulfilled their duty, so they were ready to take off. But first they told us that the lady wanted to go stay at her sister's house. Because, well, the devil. So we ended up getting roped into waiting for her sister to arrive, then driving this lady's car to her sister's. Oddly enough, it all worked out because her sister only lived about two blocks away from the convenience store we were originally trying to stumble to. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed tonight's ventures into the paranormal realm. Like I said at the start, it would certainly mean a lot to me if you could go and check out my friend Romina's channel. Link in the description and will show on screen uh, in, in a little bit. So yeah, thanks guys. If you enjoyed the video, please do not forget to drop a like and leave a comment with your thoughts. That's always a nice thing to do. If you're new here, don't forget to subscribe and hit the little bell icon for good measure. I do post every night, so that way you're guaranteed to receive your nightly spooks. If there's a story that you would like to share, feel free to send it to my email or post it on my Reddit. Please be sure to include plenty of punctuation, paragraphing and description though, as that does help a lot when selecting the stories I am going to read. But anyway, for now guys, I'm going to sign off. Click the link to Romina's channel now, and I'll see you in the next one.